Hi everyone and welcome back to Gutter Glitter, the podcast where each week I read you a chapter from my memoir by the same name. My name is Kirsten Moore and a few weeks ago I released an interview with my mum uh, following along the back of chapter two. So just touching down on my childhood and, you know, some learning difficulties that were starting to be recognized, but we didn't quite identify the childhood anxiety, uh, the generalized anxiety disorder that had kind of riddled me throughout my childhood and, you know, way into my 20s, really. Um, It wasn't really diagnosed so much back in my day because I'm 80 years old, apparently. This interview goes more into depth with body issues, body dysmorphia, uh, my history with an eating disorder and anorexia and what that looked like in our family and how that affected my mum in particular but the entire family as a whole because something as insidious as an eating disorder or an addiction of any kind has the ability to take over not just your life but the lives of those around you as well. As always if you like the show and you want to support me You can head on down to the show notes and get a copy of your very own book or you can tell your friends, rate the podcast, all of that good stuff. Uh, It really helps me get to as many ears as possible. All right. I hope you enjoy this interview and this little chat with my mum, Tina. Well, once again, I am joined by Dr. Tina Moore, my mother. (laughs) (laughs) A little bit of a shake of the head at that, but must I remind you that in my youth, when the home phone, the landline would ring and somebody would request Dr. Moore, you would say curtly, which one? Yeah, that was fun. I always (laughs) enjoyed that. (laughs) Uh, Things that embarrassed me so much as a child that you did are now feminist icon things. So well done to you. Anyway, we are back with my mum for chapter two. In my head, The Flesh Seems Thicker is the title of this chapter. The soundtrack is Silverchair, Anna's Song. And we are delving into the development or acknowledgement of my eating disorder. So after, I don't know, 13 years of being the fat friend, I eventually uh, successfully developed an eating disorder, resulting in my increased popularity which is so gross. (laughs) I was suddenly hot enough to be noticed by the opposite sex without them being embarrassed to have been seen with me, Um, which of course led to my uh, deep resentment of them and very complicated ideas about... (laughs) men, boys, the beauty industry, and my own self-image. Yeah, I guess, you know, it was even confusing to myself when I was sent to a psychiatrist, or a psychologist rather, um, by my GP, and that psychologist, after a couple of sessions, identified me with having an eating disorder, and I remember thinking, thankfully, somebody has named it and called it out because now I can't possibly continue on um, this path that was now incredibly exhausting and it was just um, it was it was killing me but but it but it also took me a, a while to wrap my head around it and I remember telling you what I had what I had been told that I had this eating disorder and um, do you remember your reaction? Uh, you you said, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm like, oh, the you know the the psychologist wants me to see an eating disorder specialist because she thinks I have anorexia. Like, no, no, you don't. <laughs> and and you know you said, well, I see you eat, and you do, and you did because I did eat. Um, it a lot was of chickpeas. <laughs> 
a lot of a lot of well it was very, it was very much the same breakfast lunch and dinner almost every day and you know no carbs all of the things that we read in teen dream magazines dolly girlfriend all of these things that you learn about as a, a high school kid that carbs are the devil you know egg whites are a, a delicious <laughs> food substitute <laughs> But anyway, that's my ramblings of, of that time. What what do you remember of that kind of period of of diagnosis or like late high school when I started to lose weight and manipulate my eating? Um to me I remember it as sudden because you seem to lose all the weight in year twelve. Mm. And year 12 is a year that in Victoria, certainly um, I hadn't come across it before, where parents of year 12 students become totally obsessed with what their VCE students are doing Mm. and eating and whether they're partying, it seems really? like a really overreaction to the end of high school life. So I hadn't experienced anything comparable in Canada. I hadn't experienced anything comparable in the UK. But suddenly in Victoria, again, because you were writing state exams and this thing called the ATAR score hovered over everybody. Um, parents of year 12 children just became completely fixated on everything their children were doing. Really? I didn't know this was going on. And I refused to become part of that. Mm. But I had never made a huge deal about what you were eating. And so... I suppose I sort of, when you started to lose weight, also subconsciously made a decision not to make a huge deal of what you were not eating. Mm. And um, I really have a strong belief you don't comment on other people's food. Yeah. I was raised with that. So the fact that you were taking more care with your food than you had before was a positive step in terms of self-pride, I suppose, and the fact that you were you were dating from year 11. You had an active social life through all of secondary school. Mm. Um, by all outward signs, you would have been a normal adolescent whose social sphere was expanding and that you were enjoying it. You were going to a lot of parties, you had good friends, Mm. and they were friends that you sustained for many, many years. So um, I just assumed that when you were taking more care with your food, it had to do with the fact that you were um, starting to have boyfriends, not just group friends. Mm. And that you were making the decision yourself. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and and when you say take more care, I want to clarify, like I was I was cooking my own food a lot more. Yeah, it would have it would have looked like I was taking more care in what I was putting in my body. I was eating a lot more vegetables and um and I mean, like that's how it begins. Like I, yeah. I remember, like the, you got the CSIRO book, the diet plan. So that was yeah. that would have been uh, low GI. Yeah, yeah. And look, we are a family of round people. We come from peasant crop. Like we hold on to whatever, whatever. we need for winter. <laughs> <laughs> whatever whatever passes our lips, yeah. our body retains. 
So it has never been easy for somebody in our family to lose weight. But we're always, I was always playing, playing, uh, such a dangerous word, um, playing with dieting as I was growing up. Mm. You know, that is sadly what a lot of teenage girls do. But it wasn't really uh, that serious until I remember you got that book and I kind of just stuck to it like a Bible um, because it lay out like each day what Ooh, breakfast, lunch and dinner and snacks and I can still remember, like, the snack was, two, you're allowed two snacks a day, you're allowed one piece of fruit, sorry, two pieces of fruit and one dairy snack, like a yogurt or something. And so then I would start, and then, you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner, you were allowed, I think, like a one, like a tiny bit of carb within your breakfast or your lunch, nothing in dinner, like, it was all vegetables, salad. I, like, I don't want to get too detailed with it in case anybody you know, latches on to these ideas. But basically I followed this Bible of telling me exactly how and what to eat every day. And then like, I became more and more afraid of the carb aspect. So if it was saying one piece of toast with an egg for breakfast, for example, I would then start to weigh that piece of bread to make sure that it aligned with whatever the book said. And if it didn't, then I'm like cutting off a piece of this tiny slice of bread. And it just became more and more detailed and more and more obsessive. And then if it was like, you know, I was allowed an apple allowed, you know, being such a dangerous word again, um, this is all anorexic language that I'm using and, you know, then I would make sure it was the smallest apple I could find, you know, mm. or if it was the yogurt, it wouldn't be like a nice Jalma full fat yogurt. It would be, it wouldn't even be low fat. It would be the no fat vari variation. Since my recovery, I have tasted no fat yogurt once. It is <laughs> so, dis it, is li it is liquid chemical goop. It is rancid. I do not know. Like, I looked for... This was my treat of the day. And it was so disgusting. I think about that now. I'm like, holy fuck. Like, how much do you have to manipulate your diet where a no-fat yogurt is the highlight of your day? And, you know, at the time as well, all those Biggest Loser shows were on. So, similarly to all the noughties stars teaching me that, you know, <laughs> that, that these tiny size zero frames were what um, celebrity and success looked like, which is what I wanted more than anything in this world. I, I was also like, we were watching the biggest loser five nights a week. Like that, do you remember? No. You don't remember sitting down and watching that show? I remember watching the first season and then then that's all. These people have never exercised, suddenly working their asses off, you know, having thousand calorie diets, like killing themselves for our entertainment and then walking out on stage and being praised for being a quarter of the person mm. physically that they mm. ever were. Interesting that it's... It has not uh, lasted mm. in the way other reality shows have lasted. And uh, thank goodness for that. It was like the Wild West of reality TV. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I remember, um, I remember bringing you to... So I started seeing a, a counsellor that specialised, a psychologist that specialised in eating disorders... But at the same time, I started seeing a dietitian. She was the main sort of guide in my recovery, I suppose. Um, and I brought you along to a session once. Do you remember much of that? I just remember blubbering through the whole thing. <laughs> at least from my point of view, that was the first time that I felt like you sort of 
had heard the depth of my self-loathing and kind of yeah. understood um, that it was more than just, um, you know, a, a, a diet fad or something like that. Yes, because you would sit down at the table and eat with us. Mm. You wouldn't necessarily eat what the rest of the family ate or what Ben and I were eating or... Um, but you, um, you, you always had your salad, you had, you know, variations on that. And I didn't think it was that unusual for a teenage girl to be fussy about food at that point, especially because you were seeing people, Mm. you know, and you had, uh, um, special boys in your life at that point and boy (laughs) and and, um so it was part and parcel of you know being a 16 17 year old I think Mm. it was year 12 that I really noticed the huge the biggest drop in weight loss because I don't think it was there in year 11 no but um there was so much going on. You were doing so many jobs at that point as well. You were doing before and after school care. Mm. Um, you were really, really busy. You were doing BCE. You were doing yoga. Uh, it was, um, you were running. I was you know, singing. I was, yeah. You were doing a lot of singing. Um, um, and I, I'm thinking of the time before you went to, to Melba. Yeah. But... Um, Melbourne is the university that I end up um, going to to study classical voice. Yeah, and you were doing drama club, you were rehearsing, so your life was very, very full and on the move mm. um, in, in that final year. And you were never refusing food. Mm. You were eating, you know, to my knowledge, you yeah. know, every day and you were eating healthy food. I mean, to be fair, I mean, the CSIRO diet is still one of the healthiest ones you can find, you know, in terms of, uh, but um, so if that was your guideline, I probably, and you had, and I had known that was your guideline, I probably wouldn't have worried, you know, about that. But um, you were obviously telling other stories to yourself, you know, as as well. I guess, um, yeah, like the main point that I want people to get out of this um, is that people really are so, uh, if they have never had an eating disorder, they really, what will be around somebody with a, with an extreme version perhaps, it can be so hard to understand and it really doesn't it's a mental illness, first and foremost. It is, you can be, you know, I remember um, Denise saying to me, my dietitian, saying to me, you know, I have clients that are 100 kilos that are anorexic. They came to me at, or they started their eating disorder at 200 kilos. You know, I put, you wouldn't look at somebody that's 100 kilos and automatically think, oh, they're anorexic. They don't look like somebody, like I say in the chapter, on Dr. Phil or, you know, one of mm. these, or Oprah coming out onto the, the, the stage with their bones jutting out, the collarbones showing, you know, no, emaciated. But they are starving themselves. They live in a world of self-loathing. And it, and it is slowly killing their body Mm. you know these people still you can be that size and still have your body shutting down you can still lose your period your hair can be falling out your you are developing osteoporosis all of these really serious issues are going on um and just because you don't look anorexic doesn't mean that you are not um suffering and mentally physically in all, all kinds of ways so I was eating, but it was, but that yeah, the the mental gymnastics that went into eating um, anything was huge. I was constantly cal- calorie counting. Um, I was constantly uh, weighing up 
exercise versus what I was eating. If I knew I was going to go out for dinner with one of my special boys in my life, I wouldn't eat lunch that day. Stuff like that, you know, that I would just manipulate in order um, to still make my diet, in inverted commas, work. Um, I do remember there was a stage, and I'm not sure whether it was that year or possibly the summer after or, or a while later, but where you did develop a reluctance to go out to social occasions mm. that you were invited to. So that was a point where I really did start to worry because that was so unlike you. Mm. And you had somewhere along the line decided that you would prefer to be at home yeah. rather than go to a social engagement where there was going to be food or yeah. that there might, uh, and possibly even drink. I'm not sure how, how that, you know, came into the picture. But um, that was a major concern when you started to weigh up the cost benefit, you know, of, uh, of going out versus staying in. Yeah. And the second one was when you started uh, crashing every afternoon. When you say crashing, you mean with exhaustion. Yeah. yeah. So it was, um, again, it was a worry because it was the, it was the, the year of uh, VCE exams, but you could barely get through the day without a nap. It just wasn't normal for somebody who, well, I mean, I suppose it was, you were up early, you were doing um, morning and evening jobs, you were involved in a number of, of um, clubs and activities. And so for a while, it didn't seem that unusual that you were mm. going to be tired as well. But then it really did become a pattern. My memory of that time is just like how angry I was, like, and... And, and also because your brain is telling you how awful, horrible, ugly, lazy, pathetic you are constantly. Um, I don't know. You feel angry. You feel depleted. You feel emotionally exhausted. And your whole day is planned out around how you're going to fit your meals in and... Um, and how you're going to get away with those with those meals and whatever that any slight change it, it completely throws everything out and i remember just feeling like completely overwhelmed all of the time and that's when i lost my tiny mind and that's when you came home to this wall of uh geography notes <laughs> that I had written in um, gold and silver Posca pens all over my, my room. I literally felt like the, like I'd lost, I had lost the plot. I thought it was a great study strategy. <laughs> <laughs> but I certainly remember the anger. I was usually the the uh the, on the receiving end of that so Sorry. you didn't really want any advice you didn't want helpful direction mm. you didn't want suggestions you didn't want questions there was no safe ground you know for a while there um Sorry, um, I love you. <laughs> um say it you back <laughs> Yes, of course, I love you too. Thank you. But there was, there was a, um, a time of walking on eggshells because there was nothing really you mm. could say that wasn't going to result in um, a minor explosion of fury. Well, I'm very sorry. My brain was starving. And that is what happens. And yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, you sort of mirror, end up mirroring the voice in your head. Um, and yeah, it is, it's, 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 uh, it's a mess. And yeah, of course that comes out on the people that you love the most. Um, especially mothers, because you know, that you that's what to, they're there for. You have to love me no matter what. <laughs> Sucker. <laughs> But yeah, no, that, um, that 
looking back at that like mental breakdown where I'm just scrolling over the walls and then you and dad come into the room like oh, wow this is this is beautiful and I'm just like rocking back and forth in a corner like help and um yeah that 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 was an interesting <laughs> yeah I think we we're probably time. afraid of passing judgment you trained us well well <clears throat> um don't know really what to say to that that's a bit <laughs> sad but yeah probably accurate as well you were mentioning just as we had a, had a little break there that I my reactions to friends letting me down or cancelling plans was very extreme um and I think I'm still I think I still struggle with that um can you just talk a little bit about what you remember from from that time well I I know that um you would make plans with a friend and usually they were quite tentative and um, one particular friend was always sort of non-committal about whether the plan, you know, whether it was going to come off or not and, and what the plan would be or what you might do together. And I just remember how angry and disappointed and almost irrational you would get when Friday night rolled around and that friend wouldn't contact you mm. and there was no sort of appeasing you in terms of well something came up or you know it was just a tentative plan anyway or you know it's been a big year and there was very little room for forgiveness it was an all-consuming anger if you were let down in terms of a, a plan to see someone you know yeah. on on let's just call it a Friday night and it's not to say that you weren't quite busy you know in your mm. life already but I really don't think I understood whether it's that the, the the person that was letting you down so much or was it just the fact that you had been let down again yeah. you know that was causing that degree of anger well this is disappointing to hear because <clears throat> I feel like I had this conversation with my psychologist last week <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell <laughs> you feel like as a person there are there's a level of, of evolution that is guaranteed with age <laughs> and then and then you write a book <laughs> um yeah I do this is something that that well if I if I just talk about what my psychologist says it's it's about my sense of um e external validation like I like I remember I, it's just a sense of rejection hmm. and and that being that sense of rejection meaning that I am I don't know invalid as a person or or unimportant or invisible or that person mm. whoever it is that cancelled plans doesn't care about me when in actual fact it has very little to do if mm. anything at all about me um and that is something i would really like to drill into my own brain because it causes me so much distress and it, like, i don't probably not as uh, no, mm. Yeah, probably just as much distress as it did in high school. Like that feeling of, of it is a feeling of abandonment. Mm. And I think that has probably gotten worse over the years because now I have experienced more and more uh, what, you know, abandonment or loss or grief or whatever. And so rather than exposure therapy make, is meant to make us stronger, somehow in my world... <laughs> It's like scraping at an open wound and um, that wound has been gaping for, I guess, 15, 20 years now. Mm -hmm. So if anyone could recommend um, a, a durable Band-Aid, that would be much appreciated. 
but in the meantime, I'll just, I'll just keep going to therapy. <laughs> Any final thoughts before we wrap this up? Well, I do apologize for saying no, you don't when you told me that you had anorexia because it was quite uh, the the visual sort of impressions that you got have of anorexia mm. were quite extreme in that time. Oh, yeah. And um, you, um, as I said, you shared three meals with us every day so it didn't register in my mind as anorexia at all and yeah and I actually yeah. like I and I do understand that like I really and, and I even understood it at the time um despite my brain bre being broken and starving mm. like and I I remember feeling I remember I remember because I remember being shocked when I heard it because I'm like, well, I'm eating, you know, and mm. anorexia doesn't eat. Like, mm. that's what I thought anorexia was. Um, or, you know, disordered eating, they call it now. Any kind of, you know, disordered eating. Um, but so I, I understood why you you did say that. Um, but, yeah, it is it. the more that I sort of have learnt about eating disorders myself and in my own experience it has so little to do with with physicality and what we see and what a person mm. consumes and so much more to do with the way they think and feel um and about themselves and and what has changed you know like um what has shifted in their eating and so well it was it was a Quite a shock that I accompanied you to the dietitian that time to find the level of self loathing and the um, level of psychological dysfunction that was happening in your head as, mm. as when this was going on. And mm. that broke my heart. Oh, Mum. <laughs> well, thank you for coming along for the ride and being my biggest advocate ever since. You're the best. I love you. Love you. Thank you so much for listening. I had to cut the interview short right there because we both started to cry, which is amazing for both of us. Generally, if we're having a deep chat like that, both of us would be in tears by the three-minute mark at maximum. So I think we did pretty well to get about half an hour chit-chat out of us. Next week, I'm going to be reading you Chapter 5, this world ain't exactly what my heart expected. See you then.